Welcome to the Evergreen Thumb. I'm your host, Erin Landon, a Washington State University Extension Master Gardener since 2015 and a certified permaculture designer and modern homesteader. I'm here to share up-to-date research-based horticulture and environmental stewardship knowledge to help you grow and manage your garden and to share what the WSU Extension Master Gardener program is all about. WSU Extension Master Gardener volunteers are university-trained community educators who have been cultivating plants, people, and communities since 1973. Are you ready to grow? Let's dig into today's episode. Welcome to episode 16 of the Evergreen Thumb. My guest today is Tira McKelvey. Tira is the Managing Director and Pollination Program Educator for RentMeesAndBees.com. Tira oversees the efforts to help gardeners host solitary bees and engages in public outreach to teach more people about solitary bees and the importance of taking care of all of our pollinators. In addition to writing feature articles for national publications, Tira also produces educational videos that can be seen on their YouTube channel. Before Tira joins us to talk about solitary bees, we're going to talk about the March gardening calendar. For planning in March, it's time to Make sure that your vegetable garden is fully planned. Spring, summer, and fall vegetables. If you don't have an in-ground gardening space or designated space, consider container gardening. For maintenance, compost, grass clippings, and yard waste. Unless your clippings are from lawns that have been treated with weed and feed or weed killers. Spread compost over your garden and landscape areas. Prune currants and gooseberries and fertilize or with manure or a complete fertilizer. You can fertilize evergreen shrubs and trees if needed. If established and healthy, their nutrient needs should be minimal and you shouldn't need to fertilize. The same goes for rhododendrons, camellias, and azaleas. Um, if they're already established and healthy, then they probably don't need fertilizer. But if um, you do need to fertilize, use an acid type fertilizer specific for rhododendrons and azaleas. In Western Washington, you can prune spring flowering shrubs after the blossoms have faded. For planting and propagation, it's time to divide hostas, daylilies, and mums. You can use stored scion wood to graft fruit and ornamental trees. Plant insectiary plants like alyssum, phacelia, candy tuft, sunflowers, yarrow, and dill to attack beneficial insects to the garden. If the soil is dry enough, you can begin preparing your vegetable garden and plant cool season crops. Onions can be started indoors by seed. In western Washington, you can plant berry crops uh, such as blackberries, strawberries, blueberries, currants. It's a good time to get those in the ground. For pest monitoring and management, uh, you can spray trees and shrubs for webworms and leaf rollers if they are present in your trees and shrubs. Protect new growth from slugs. The least toxic options include traps and barriers. Use caution around pets and pollinators. As you will hear in this episode, slug bait can contaminate mud and is toxic to many pollinators, including mason bees. Learn to identify predatory insects that can help keep aphids and other pests under control. Prune ornamentals for air circulation and to help prevent fungal diseases. Uh, For Western Washington, monitor for European crane fly and treat if damage has been verified. Uh, For houseplants and indoor gardening, it's a time to start tuberous begonias, and you can take geraniums, begonias, and fuchsias out of storage for western Washington. Water, fertilize, cut back if necessary, and you can move them outdoors come April. As you can see, things are starting to ramp up a little bit, and it's getting to be spring, so enjoy the nice weather. Enjoy being able to get out in the garden if it's warm enough and dry enough. Spring is coming. Now that we have finished the March gardening calendar, let's move on to my talk with Tira McKelvey. Tira, thanks for joining me today. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. 
Oh, well, it's great to have you here. Um, why don't we start off with uh, you telling us a little bit about yourself and uh, your experience with solitary bees? Oh, thank you. So yeah, I I, uh, I got started with uh, mason bees when my daughter was seven and my son was five, and my daughter was paranoid of bees. And I came home one day with a mason bee starter kit, hung it up in our yard, and she fell in love with these little bees because they are super sweet. And she called them mermaid bees because they have this green iridescent sheen on them. And both my kids went out and they would count the holes in the mason bee block. And we just did math with it and had fun with it. And it's just it's just taken off from there. And so then I've been working for the company for what? eight, seven, eight years now. So it's just been, it's been such a joy to be able to teach more people about mason bees and leafcutter bees. So to start off, let's talk more about what solitary bees are or, and how they are different from uh, like honeybees or um, other like colony, colony bees. Yeah. You know, before I started even knowing, I didn't know what a solitary bee meant. I had never heard the word before. Everybody knows what a honeybee is, but I had never heard a solitary bee. And it means alone by themselves. So I like to I like to now coin it as each female is their own queen. So a solitary bee, all the females lay all their own eggs, gather their own food, and find their own nest. So she does it all by herself. She doesn't have a hive or worker bees or anybody. Solitary bees alone by themselves. So she does all the work. Honeybees has the queen and the queen will lay what I don't know, it's 2000 eggs a day and uh, solitary bees, mason bees will lay about 15 eggs in their lifetime. So it's a much different life cycle than a, so- than a solitary bee and a social honeybee. So it's a big distinction between our, our pollinators. What makes mason bees um, great pollinators for the garden? Yeah. So, um, the little, little mason bees have uh, little hairs on their belly called scopa, S-C-O-P-A, scopa. And when they belly flop onto these flowers, because they're kind of those clumsy little bees, they just plunk along and they plop onto the flower. Those little hairs collect all the pollen that from the plant and they're, it's loose pollen. When you look at a honeybee, you can see how it meticulously collects uh, pollen on the back hind legs because it has to carry it back to its hive. But solitary bees, they just flop along, they land on these flowers, and that loose pollen gets spread all over. So they are actually Mother Nature's best pollinator. Everything they touch, they pollinate about 95% of everything they land on, where honeybees only pollinate 5%. It's a huge distinction between the honeybees and the solitary bees. And solitary bees will get to about 2,000 blossoms a day. And because they are native, the blue orchard mason bee is native and they're used to our colder, wetter climate, you will see solitary bees out flying if it's misty, not torrential downpour, but if it's if it's rainy and it's kind of cold outside, you'll still see solitary bees out there working where the um, honeybees don't like it when it's really cold and, and wet. So it's a bit, bit different. So are there specific plants that are better or that they're more attracted to than others? Yeah. So that's a really key distinction to um, especially mason bees. So mason bees are your spring pollinators. When you start to see dandelions pop up in your yard, that means that your temperature is starting to warm up for spring. I always consider, and a lot of uh, uh, people in our industry, you know, dandelions are a bee's first food, but it's a pollinator's first food. So all those early pollinators that come out in springtime rely on those early spring bloom flowers. Um, so it's really important if you are hosting mason bees in your yard that you provide food that's going to be blooming in early spring. Mason bees will emerge when temperatures reach about 55 degrees. Now there's a distinction with that. So that's daytime temperatures. So because we're coming off of the winter and it's going to be cold at night, those daytime temperatures can dip between, you know, below 55 degrees, but the daytime needs to be 55 in order for them to emerge and pollinate and do their thing. And they're going to need food. So if you're hosting Mason bees, you need to make sure that you're planting in your yard early spring blooms. Um, I always tell people in early spring, go ahead to your nursery. And what you see blooming is uh, a really great thing to then plant in your yard. Uh, We've also partnered with pollinator.org 
org. Um, and they have these beautiful garden cards that will tell you exactly what to plant in your yard for spring, for summer, for fall to support all pollinators in your yard. Um, we have a link on our website up on our partners tab that you can go to and you can find that resource. Uh, but yeah, it's really important that mason bees have early spring blooms and that, um, that they have a great habitat to uh, support them. Um, so what kind of role do mason bees play in fruit and vegetable yields? Huge. So Blue Orchard Mason Bee is their name because they have helped orchards. And so apples, blueberries, cherries, almonds, like anything that's a fruit blooming uh, tree, mason bees will do wonders with it. So, um, you know, I know around here there's a lot of um, Asian plums that bloom really early. So if you have mason bees, um, they're going to help with those early spring blooms. Um, but you know, there will be, you know, the, what is it? 400 mason bees do the work of 40,000 honeybees. I mean, they're amazing pollinators because of how well they pollinate with that loose pollen all over their little bellies. So, um, they're remarkable pollinators and you only need about three to five mason bees to pollinate an entire apple tree. I mean, they're remarkable little pollinators. So, so some of the early vegetable crops too, then that would be flowering like peas and um, things like that? Or Well, good question, because it depends when those peas are blooming. Um, I know there's different blueberries that'll bloom in spring and then some blueberries that'll bloom in summer, but mason bees only live six to eight weeks and they're done after that. So uh, if you're if you have things that are blooming later in spring, then you're going to want to release your mason bees later in spring. Um, Cause I don't know, I, I wouldn't know what time your peas are blooming, but yeah, they will pollinate anything in your yard that's blooming in the springtime. Okay. Well, that makes me think maybe we should backtrack a little bit on the life cycle of the mason bee and um, you know, the, how they nest and, and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Mason bees, I like when I, I teach a lot of kids at schools and education and, um, adults too, they can connect with it, but Mason bees are like a butterfly. They spin a silk cocoon and they hibernate, hibernate in that cocoon all winter long. And then they emerge in spring when the temperatures reach 55. So Mason bee, she's going to go out and she's going to look for nesting chambers in your habitat whether that is woodpecker holes or reeds or crevices and nooks, or you provide a bee hotel. Um, mason bee mandibles are not strong enough to chew wood. So those are the carpenter bees. We get asked that a lot of times. Um, mason bees need to find natural holes in their habitat. So what mama mason bee is going to do is she's going to go fly around. She's going to go collect mud in your yard. And because she's using mud in her nesting chambers, it's really, really important not to use slug bait or pesticides or anything in your yard that's going to seep into that mud that's going to harm her babies inside. When we open up nesting blocks and we can see the nesting chambers and there is a larva or an egg or a larva that hasn't developed and it's died, that sometimes means that it's eaten uh, toxic um, pollen or has been contaminated by the mud and it, it kills the baby larva. So it's really important if you're hosting mason bees that you're not using any pesticides in your, in your yard that's going to harm them. Um, but what that mason bee is going to do is she's going to go fly out. She's going to find that natural hole. She's going to crawl into the hole and she's going to plug it with mud. And then she'll go out and she'll gather pollen and she'll put a loaf of pollen next to the mud cap. Then she'll lay a tiny little egg and then she'll cap it with mud. So it'll be mud, pollen, baby, mud, mud, pollen, baby, mud, mud, pollen, baby, mud. We do a little song in school when we do the mud, pollen, baby, mud. Um, and there'll be about five to seven little nascent bee cells in each one of those nesting chambers, nesting holes. And then that little egg will hatch into a larva. The larva will consume the entire pollen loaf and then it will spin a silk cocoon. It then hibernates in that cocoon all winter long and it will emerge as a full grown bee. Um, we just launched a video uh, last year at, in the fall that uh, it took us two years to film the life cycle of a mason bee. And it's 
it's pretty remarkable. I used my macro lens to film it. We got bees up close, little larvae eating the pollen. We, um, I was able to capture a mason bee spinning a silk cocoon while it was inside the silk. It's pretty fascinating. If you guys like that kind of stuff, I encourage you to go check out the video. Um, and I also incorporate in that same video the predators that harm them um, and why it is so important to uh, harvest and clean your mason bees every year. So... All right. And we'll include a link to that video um, in the show notes. So anybody who wants to check that out, you can find a link there. We kind of touched on this a bit when you were talking about um, uh, spring flowers, but um, are there other ways that uh, gardeners can support mason bees in their gardens? Um, it, yeah, if you have it, so n- mason bees are using crevices and logs and reeds and stuff like that in your yard. Um, there was a whole campaign for not raking your leaves until after spring, because a lot of pollinators will go and use moths or butterflies. They'll go and they'll use the leaf to wrap up and and make their cocoon. You know, mason bees are going to do the same thing. If you have those old um, plants in your yard that you've trimmed and there's mason bee holes in there, just wait till mid spring um, to clean up, clean up everything um, as best as you can. Cause I know a lot of people want to maintain their, their spring yards. They get the spring clean itch and they want to go out and clean, but um you know, the, the key elements for mason bees is just making sure that you have a really good source of mud for them that's nice and clean and not contaminated with pesticides. And, you know, they're going to go out and find natural holes in your habitat. And most of the time, mason bees aren't going to go ground dwelling. Um, those are minor bees and other types of bees, uh, bumblebees. But um, mason bees will find little nooks and crevices, usually off the ground in your yard. So... We kind of, I guess we kind of touched on this too, some of the threats and challenges uh, to the bee uh, populations that gardeners need to be aware of. Like you said, slug, slug bait and contaminated mud. Are there other threats or, or concerns? Yeah, so there's a whole, um, I'm doing a really big awareness campaign um, this year and we, we're the largest solitary bee provider in the country. And we partner with research teams and bee labs all over the country that are studying predators that harm mason bees and solitary bees. And with our research and what we've, you know, we clean 3 million mason bees every season. It's a lot of bees. I'm opening up a lot of blocks. We're seeing a lot of predators coming through. And that's why it's so important to harvest and clean your nesting blocks every fall. Um, I always get asked, well, why clean? In nature, bees don't go out and clean. You know, we don't have to clean in nature that where they're laying their babies. In nature, they're camouflaging their nesting chambers. It's hard to find them. But when you're setting out a bee hotel, you're, I like to describe it as, as you're putting out a sign that says vacancy, come on in, because you're allowing really great access for these predators to just hang out at the nesting block or the, your reeds or whatever you have and just access those tubes at, at any time because their main predators are kleptoparasites. So you have the mono wasp and the Houdini fly that utilize the nesting chambers to lay their babies. So a Houdini fly will wait outside the nesting chamber for mama mason bee to leave. And again, remember we have the mud, pollen, baby, and then mud. Well, mama mason bee is going out collecting pollen and building stuff for her nest. Well, when the mama mason bee leaves, that Houdini fly waits for her to leave. And then she, the, the Houdini fly crawls into that nesting chamber and will lay about 15 to 30 of her babies. Mama Mason Bee doesn't know this. She'll cap that cell with mud. And now you'll have mud, pollen, tiny Mason Bee baby, 15 larvae of Houdini fly, and mud. And I have lots of videos online showing what the inside of a cell looks like with a bunch of Houdini fly. The problem with this predator is it's growing rapidly. So people that aren't cleaning or taking care of their Mason Bees, they're gonna have a, a complete overrun of predators in their habitat. because when do you think those Houdini fly hatch? They're going to wait until spring. Their life cycle is the same as mason bees. So when the mason bees emerge, the Houdini fly emerge at the same time. So if you're leaving all those predators in there, now you have a one to 15 ratio of one mason bee to 15 Houdini fly. And we're talking about just one cell. So you can imagine when we open up a cell and it's completely full of Houdini fly larvae or pollen mites or chocolate or whatever, what other fun stuff that we get to find. So 
So how do mason bees contribute to the uh, biodiversity of an of a ecosystem? Yeah, so because they're such amazing pollinators, they're going to make everything they touch grow bigger and stronger. Uh, You'll get a lot more fruit on your fruit trees. You're going to have a lot more healthier plants in your yard. And anytime you have a healthier plant, you're going to have healthier soil. You're going to have healthier air. And so they are remarkable pollinators because they just make everything in your yard grow bigger and stronger. Are there other... um interesting behaviors with solitary bees that people might not know? Behaviors. Well, they are super sweet little bees. Like you can stand right next to your nesting block and watch them. They're so docile and sweet. They're not going to swarm. They don't, I, you'll see, I have a video where I stand in front of a block of 1200 bees and we release a whole bunch and they're just, they just fly around and they, they don't bother you at all. They don't attack. They don't sting. Um, the males don't have a stinger at all. The females have a tiny little stinger, but they never use it. I actually got, if you want to say stung for the first time after seven years, because I was trying to do a video with a Mason bee and I dumped her out onto my hand and she wasn't happy with me. And it was just like this little zap. It didn't even, it wasn't, they don't have, um, what's the, uh, the, the shock, the uh, venom, they don't have the venom that's going to put people that are allergic to bees. They don't have any of that. It was more like when you shuffle your feet and you touch something and you shock yourself, that's what it felt like. It, it didn't even hurt. It, it just went away. But, you know, if, if you get one stuck up your watch or, you know, in your wristband, or you're trying to get a cute picture of them for uh, educational video purpose and you make her mad. <laughs> she wasn't happy about that. So, but I stand there all the time and I watch these little bees. Kids don't have to worry about them. In schools, I will go around and I'll have all the kids sit crisscross applesauce and they have to be really quiet. And then they get to hold a baby bee, which is a cocoon. And they just find it fascinating. And sometimes they can sit there and listen to the cocoon. And if you hear a little crackling noise like Rice Krispies, that's the sound of the mason bee starting to chew through that cocoon. And if you're in your yard, in your garden, and you have mason bees during the early springtime, I encourage you to go out to your nesting block or wherever you're releasing your bees and just listen for that crackling noise. It's a really distinct sound. It's very cool because those are the mason bees chewing out of the cocoons to emerge. And once all of your mason bees have emerged, um, we do a whole science curriculum for schools. Um, The teachers can go out to those the white PVC tubes, that's how we distribute our bees in these emergence tubes. They can go and empty the cocoons and then the kids can study them in their labs under microscopes and really take a look. They can squish, they're empty now, there's no bees left anymore, but they can now turn that project into investigating and looking at all the cocoons and you can squish them and they actually do sound like a little Rice Krispie treat. So there's a lot of things that um, parents can do and teachers can do to teach our kids about, about these little bees. Can we talk about some other predators as well with the mason bees? Oh, sure. That I think is important to mention um, because pollen mites is another predator that we see a lot. And people wonder what a pollen mite is and what chalk brood fungus is. Um, So, and then we'll jump over to leafcutter bees because I do want to mention the other predators that harm our little bees, our little pollinators. Um, So pollen mites are these little tiny um, little spider looking things that the mason bees and honeybees and all our bees go and collect on the flowers. So they'll land on a flower belly flop. They'll get that pollen all them. Well, there'll be a little pollen mite on that flower that they'll carry back into their nesting chamber. Pollen mites multiply crazy rapidly. It's so fast. So I have a lot of videos on pollen mites. It's in that one life cycle of a Mason bee video as well that you'll link. Um, but what happens if with pollen mites is just like the Houdini fly and the mono wasp is the pollen mites will stay in that nesting chamber until the following spring. And what happens is if you're not cleaning your nesting material, that mason bee is going to emerge from the cocoon. He or she is going to crawl through the nesting chamber, is going to crawl through those pollen mites. Those pollen mites will stick on its back and then it'll get out of the nesting chamber. And then that mason bee is now carrying the pollen mites that are spreading all around your garden that are going to harm all your other pollinators. So it's really important if you're hosting bees in your yard that you're harvesting and cleaning because you can get rid of all the pollen mites, you can get rid of the Houdini fly and the chalk brood. 
Um, chalkroot is a fungus. Um, it's also on the on the flowers in your garden. It's a tiny microscopic spore that when the mason bee goes out and collects pollen, she'll carry it back to her nesting chamber. And then the baby mason bee will start to consume the pollen that mom left for it. Well, what happens is if there is a fungus spore in that pollen loaf, that baby will consume it. And then the spores will essentially dry it from the inside. You'll see in some of the videos, they're black. They turn solid black. They dries them up and they, they, they don't survive. But what happens with the chalk brood is the spores will burst in the nesting chamber. And so that nesting chamber of mud, pollen, chalk brood, baby, mud, now that becomes contaminated with all these tiny little spores that you can't even see with your eye. But then again, if the mason bee emerges and crawls through that, now those spores are being spread in your yard. So um, it's really important before we move on to leaf cutters that if you're having mason bees and you're hosting mason bees, that you're not using logs with holes drilled in it or bamboo reeds, because those are nesting chambers that cannot be opened and clean. And you have to be able to get to your mason bees and clean them every fall. And then in the springtime, you have to put out clean nesting material every spring. Because again, the chalk brood spores, uh, the fungus will linger, and the pollen mites will linger, and the Houdini fly. So you've got to sterilize your nesting material or replace it completely with brand new nesting material every spring. Sorry, I wanted to make sure to mention that because it's so important for people to learn. Let's talk about leafcutter bees. Yeah. So leafcutter bees are your summer pollinators. They emerge when temperatures are about 75 degrees. Um, with our program, we provide a pollinator kit with mason and leafcutter bees. And the mason bees and leafcutters are not out at the same time. So like I mentioned earlier, the mason bees only live six to eight weeks, spring pollinators, when the mason bees are done flying and are, are done pollinating, then you swap your blocks. You take the mason bee block out, you put your leaf cutter block in, and then you wait for the leaf cutter bees to emerge when temperatures are 75. Now, leaf cutter bees have a different life cycle. Mason bees hibernate in a cocoon and grow into a full grown bee and are ready to emerge as a full grown bee in early spring. Leaf cutter bees need the temperatures to be 75 plus degrees. And inside their little nesting nesting chamber, they're a teeny tiny larvae. When they feel the temperatures of 75, then they eat the pollen loaf that mom left. And it takes them about six to eight weeks to grow into a full grown bee, depending on how hot it is. And then they'll emerge. So it, it, leaf cutter bees take a little bit longer because their life cycle is different. Um, but you can sometimes, if you live in a hot state, you can sometimes get two or three generations of leafcutter bees because they'll lay the babies again. And then if it's 75, then those babies will grow and perk up and you'll get another life cycle of baby, baby bees. So interesting. Yeah. So, um, and I'm assuming leafcutter bees are native to Washington as well. So we get that question a lot. Um, they're not native. Uh, your blue orchard mason bees are native, but honeybees aren't native either. So leafcutter bees were brought over to help save the alfalfa crops. And so a lot of people, they've been around for decades. So they are the bee, um, leafcutter bees are amazing pollinators to pollinate all of your veggie gardens and anything blooming in summertime. Um, but no, I can't say that they're not native, but you know, honeybees aren't either, um, but they're not harming anything because they're actually helping your ecosystem because of their, they also have the little belly hair scopa as well. So they're amazing little pollinators. Okay. So you said they, so say in like Western Washington, is it more likely we'll get one life cycle? Depending yeah, on right. it, yeah. Well, if you're <laughs> east of the mountains, you might get more because it's warmer over there, but right. yeah, in the Seattle Everett, you know, in the, this side, you'll probably only get one, one life cycle. And I usually put my leaf cutters out mid July because it's so cold. We don't really warm up to 75 until it gets, you know, later in the summertime. So yeah, I think I'm a little warmer down here, but not very much. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, are there specific plants that leaf cutter bees are particularly like to, um, feed on? Um, same thing with like mason bees. They just like those summer blooms. 
And pollinator.org has a great garden cards and references to plant what to plant in your yard. Um, but no, I mean, they're just amazing little pollinators. You know, they're really good with veggie gardens. They love, if you have a veggie garden, they're, they're going to help you out there. So, okay. What about uh, predators or threats to the, to the leafcutter bees? Yeah, they have different types of predators, but not um, not to the extent that the mason bees do, um, because they're so tiny. Uh, you know, you'll see uh, these little red looking like they look like little red caterpillars in their nesting chambers. Um, they're a type of moth that'll get in there. Um, they'll have uh, wasps can attack them and get into their nesting chambers. Um, so mono wasps, um, there's different types of uh, wasps that'll impact mason bees and different types of wasps that'll impact leaf cutters. So another kleptoparasite. Okay. So how big is a full grown leaf cutter bee? Is it significantly smaller than a mason bee? Yeah, they're teeny tiny. Yeah. So if you want to, I'll send you a video link. Um, I did a video where I was holding these little tiny leaf cutter bees and they're like the half size of my pinky. They're so small. Um, but I can send you that video because I did a whole video and then I was able to get macro lens of these leaf cutter bees up close. Um, and they're remarkable. Their eyes are so beautiful. So yeah, I can send you that video if you want to share it as well. They're so they're, they're cute little bees. Okay. So where does the name leaf cutter, I'm assuming that means that they feed on leaves. Yeah, that's a good question. I probably should have started with that. Um, so Mason bees get their name Mason because of mud masonry work. So they use mud for, for making their nesting chambers. Leaf cutter bees use tiny pieces of leaves and they cut little tiny half circles. Um, they don't damage the plant. They use it for their nesting chambers. But what a leaf cutter bee does is she'll go out and she'll find a teeny tiny leaf. She'll cut it off and she'll crawl into that hole. She'll go in the back and she'll form it into, she'll chew it, make it really pliable and she'll push it up around the edges. She'll go back and get a couple more leaves and she'll do the same thing. So she's chewing up these leaves making them really pliable and soft. And then she'll get pollen and she'll lay a pollen loaf and then she'll lay an egg and then she'll go get more leaves, chew them up and take these tiny little leaf cells uh, and make it be, now it's just leaf pollen baby leaf. And she wraps them up. I call it like a little leaf sleeping bag. Um, and we have a video online for the leaf cutter harvest. So you can see what these tiny little leaf cells look like. Um, but I call it nature's artwork. They are so beautiful. Um, my team knows that when they see a leaf cutter cell, I have a couple pictures up of, a, sometimes they use flowers, flower petals for their leaf, for their, um, leaf sleeping bags. And then you get pinks and purples and whites. And it's just it's so beautiful when you see a leaf cutter cell. Cool. So, um, what are some, uh, things that gardeners can do to encourage healthy populations of solitary bees? Yeah. So, um, we have these garden signs this year, um, that says pollinators at work and it teaches people about, uh, solitary bees where they can find them in their yard. Um, I had a host one year contact me so upset. He went on vacation and he came home and all his mason bees were dead and his neighbor next door to him had sprayed pesticides in his yard and it uh, trickled over to his bee house because they shared a fence and it, it killed all his mason bees. So mason bees are really sensitive to pesticides, um, sprays, uh, anything like that in your yard. Um, back in the Midwest with the hosts that we work with, because we send, we're able to send bees nationwide, um, you know, mosquito spray is a big problem. Um, so if people are spraying mosquito spray uh, in their yards, that's going to also harm pollinators. Um, so yeah, it's really important to, you know, keep those dandelions. There was a whole campaign last year, no mow May, get away with it. Don't have to mow your yard in May. Keep those dandelions up. It's a, it's a first food for all pollinators, um, moths, hummingbirds, bats, like they're all amazing food for all your spring pollinators. Um, and then, yeah, throughout the year, just make sure you're not using pesticides and you have a pollinator friendly yard and uh, you're planting amazing flowers and food for your bees. And, you know, the biggest thing is you're out enjoying them. I think when I have my bees in my garden, I will go put a blanket out on one of my busy flowers and I will just sit there and I'll watch and I'll count how many species of bees and moths and butterflies. And it's just, your garden comes alive with all these little pollinators. And, 
you know, I just want to thank all of our hosts and everybody out there that supports pollinators because it's so important to make sure we're planting a great habitat to support our pollinators. Yeah, I just recently heard a fact that they're estimating there's over 600 species of bees in Washington state. Mm -hmm. And they're actually in the process of doing a, a an actual catalog of all the different species of bees. Yeah. Yeah. So 90% of bees are solitary. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And so we work with the USDA Bee Lab and, and UC Riverside, UC Davis, Penn State. We work with a lot of bee labs that are studying bees and making sure that, um, you know, we're educating ourselves on how to properly take care of them. So, yeah. All right. Um, any other, anything else you want to share about solitary bees? You know, I get asked, you know, where should I hang my mason bee house? Where, what, where should I put it in my yard? Um, and you know, you want to have it in the morning sun, south, south facing or whatever direction that our houses are painted black to attract the heat. So that's, I'll say the black house. So our black houses are painted black. Um, and you hang them up in the south facing morning sunshine. They need morning to mid afternoon sun. You don't want to hang them on a tree because that's going to get shaded. You're going to want to put it on a fence post or the side of the house, or some people will take like a really nice planter pot. They'll fill it with rock. They'll put a two by four post in it and then fill it with soil, plant little flowers on the bottom of it. And then they have their portable bee house. Um, once you hang your mason bee house, you're not going to want to move it. It's got to stay up for that season, for that year. Um, what happens when the males emerge from your emergence tube is they're going to mark it with a scent mark. And you'll notice it looks like mud. Uh, so the male bees will mark it with scent and they'll come out. They'll fly off. It takes the girls about a week or two later to emerge. So boys always emerge first. Boys have a white tuft of hair on their head and then the girls come out. Um, And then the boys and the girls, as I say to my kids, give lots of piggyback rides. They have lots of fun. And then the girls will come back and they'll start laying their babies and doing, um, you know, they only lay about 15 babies in their lifetime. Um, So when you see little mud marks on your emergence tube, that means the boys are coming out. And then the girls will soon to follow. All right. Any last thoughts you want to share? So make sure you have a mud supply nearby, about 10 feet from your bee house, a nice clean mud supply, hanging in a sunny, warm spot, flowers for early blooms and 55 degrees um, to get them going for spring. And then they don't stay out year round at the end of spring when they are done pollinating. Again, six to eight weeks when you stop seeing your mason bee activity, you're going to want to remove that nesting chamber, those nesting cells, whether you're using a block or you're using um, cardboard tubes, you're going to want to store them safely in a cool garage or shed over summer. They don't stay out year round. And then you open and harvest and clean them. Once they've spun that full cocoon, you'll clean them in the fall, keep them in hibernation mode in a refrigerator. And I have a video on how to do that. I can send you how to clean your own bees and then, yeah, then they'll emerge the following spring. Great. Well, thanks so much for joining us. That's a lot of of great information. I'll link to your whole YouTube channel, but the life cycle of the bee specifically I'll put on uh, in the show notes. So there's lots of resources out there on uh, Mason bees. Thanks for joining me today. Yes. Well, thank you for having us. And I'm, I just love teaching. So if anyone has questions they're welcome to give us, give me an email or or pop us a call. So. All right. I will uh, share that info. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Evergreen Thumb, brought to you by the WSU Extension Master Gardener Program volunteers and sponsored by the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State. We hope that today's discussion has inspired and equipped you with valuable insights to nurture your garden. The Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State is a nonprofit organization whose primary purpose is to provide unifying support and advocacy for WSU Extension Master Gardener programs throughout Washington State. To support the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State, visit www.mastergardenerfoundation.org forward slash donate. Whether you're an experienced Master Gardener or just starting out, the WSU Extension Master Gardener program is here to support you every step of the way. WSU Extension Master Gardeners empower and sustain diverse communities with relevant, unbiased, research-based horticulture education. Reach out to your local WSU Extension office to connect with master gardeners and tap into a wealth of resources that can help you achieve gardening success. 
To learn more about the program or how to become a Master Gardener, visit mastergardener.wsu.edu forward slash get hyphen involved. If you enjoyed today's episode and want to stay connected with us, be sure to subscribe to future episodes filled with expert tips, fascinating stories, and practical advice. Don't forget to leave a review and share it with fellow gardeners to spread the joy of gardening. Questions or comments to be addressed in future episodes can be sent to hello at theevergreenthumb.org. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed by guests of this podcast are their own and do not imply endorsement by Washington State University or the Master Gardener Foundation of Washington State. Mm-hmm.